This podcast episode is brought to you by The Cry Lounge. The Cry Lounge is an independent publishing company founded by this podcast host, Bonnie Orbison. The Cry Lounge transfers your daydreams onto paper. With two book releases the past two years, they are preparing to extend their service to other authors and other creatives. To get more details and support this show, there's a link in the description you can check out. The Cry Lounge looks forward to meeting you. My name is Bonnie Orbison, and this is my podcast, Bonnie's Legends. <laughs> This was, ladies and gentlemen, E.B. Solis on my theme song for season two. Hello, everyone, to a new episode of Bonnie's Legends. This week's guest is Mel Ingrid. I'm so super proud of her. And I can't express in words how much I love that I have an all as my guest in this podcast. I mean, if you listen to the Class Jets episode last week, if you haven't, do that afterwards. Um, if you have listened to it, you already heard a writer's talk. Like, the Class Child and I, we are both writers. So, if you like this one, and you thought like, oh, this was a real writer's talk, then this episode of Mel Ingrid we show you completely an extreme way of a writer's talk. We talk so much about writing and how it is to be a writer and when to write. How it is to be a self-publisher and how it is to edit your own book. So have fun listening and make sure to subscribe to this podcast with me. Have fun. So actually for season two, I wanted like in season one, I had people over 20, 30 and it was really interesting, but I, at that point, I said, for season two, I want to have more teens. Like, I'm a teenager. Why don't I interview teenagers? And then I think we are Lucas. I discovered you. And then I was like, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And I was like, oh, I think I interview her. She's, she looks really nice. <laughs> I didn't know you were classes. I did. I do. I take them off for gla um photos. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I have classes too, but I'm really how are you saying Wayne? Wayne. Like I'm Wayne to wear them. Oh yeah. I yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm short sighted, so I just need them for like for like classes or something like this, but um yeah. or watching TV, but I'm even not wearing them to watch TV. I'm just watching an unshop that's fine too <laughs> <laughs> i'm so i don't know what i have with classes i don't know but you're so beautiful thank you why are you in your in your room yeah i'm in my room i just like the background i don't know i have like a lot of content in this room yeah exactly like me with my clothes yeah. and wall board but it's actually the, my board is not finished yet <laughs> Sitting, I also have like this bulletin board. I plan stuff on it, um, but it's it's very um, lonely right now. I do a lot of planning more on paper these days. 
Yeah, that's true. Like when I released my first book, I was, it was like full and then I also planned for Bonnie's Legends and it was full. And after these two projects like went, I just, you know, washed it everything off. And since then, I'm really thinking about like pinning photos or something, but I don't know. <laughs> Too lazy to do that. Um, so you live in New Jersey. That's near New York or where is that? Yeah, that is near New York in the East Coast, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Great. But you you grew up in Long Island, I read. Yeah, yeah. On I Google did. Books. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate the research. <laughs> yeah, because my mom said something. Actually, okay, so normally I'm always researching and that stuff, but like in the last weeks, I really became lazy and just thinking that we're vibing, that we're just talking <laughs> and that I don't have to research. And yeah. my mom was at dinner, we talked and she was like, yeah, what's that book about? And I was like, oh, oh, okay. Um, maybe you should research that. And then I just read the, your biography too. <laughs> how, how is it? Like, I'm always want to live one day in New York hopefully the future will give me this gift um how how was it to grow up in Long Island New York and now living in New Jersey well I actually moved from New York to Singapore for my dad's job my parents are from Taiwan but we went there for his job anyway and then I moved back to the states to Jersey around three years ago so it's actually been like a pretty um eventful you know growing up situation yeah and your dad came then the few to new jersey or just you oh no my entire family we just relocated back here <laughs> what is your dad's job um he works in banking okay you know computer stuff i'm not too aware <laughs> yeah yeah i have the same feeling like my dad is oh now hold on I'm always trying to explain it, but I never look up the word. I have to look it now. <laughs> Come, Mac. Hold on. Car mechanic. Oh, car mechanic. <laughs> oh. And my mom is a hairdresser. So they oh. totally, and my, my brother has a coaching consulting business factory and then I'm coming I'm an author <laughs> <laughs> no I feel that like in my family I am kind of well I wouldn't say the first to pursue like art stuff like my cousin mm -hmm. art and communications but like writing that's like you know yeah I was also the first one who played an instrument in my family who said she wants to become an like an artist and uh, the first one who said podcasting literally my brother has for like five years he's 14 years older than me oh, i have wow. to say that so uh he has since five years he tells me that he wants to make a podcast and now i'm the first one who, do, who does that but i never had the plan or something to do that, <laughs> that. that's great how when did you write your first book hold on Bus 59 and a half. <laughs> um, so I started it in 2016, I think. Wow. It's been a while. Like, it came out in 2018. Um, it took a really long time to plan, mm -hmm. but a much shorter time to actually write the final draft, I guess. Yes. It felt like I was getting really tired of the idea at the end, so I had to, like wrap it up get it done you know yeah yeah exactly what happened to me I wrote follow me in like six months or something I was really like it was done and yeah. then I really were like one and a half years it took me to publish it because I was like thinking oh maybe you should go to a publisher then I got contracts by publisher but they were really expensive and I was like no a publisher shouldn't shouldn't you know you shouldn't pay yeah. a publisher and mm -hmm. then uh, a good friend of mine Tim who everybody knows because I'm always dedicating everything to him um, he died last year so mm -hmm. he helped me in kind of getting the first steps in key KDB and Amazon publishing mm -hmm. and so after he died I was like okay I'm just doing it on my own 
<laughs> I can do that. And so, yeah, it took me also two years. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Publishing is rough anywhere. Yes. National or self-publishing, it's always such a battle. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Um, that's why I really appreciate that you took my cover on this petition line. Yeah, of course. I was like thinking, oh, it's German, but yeah, okay, you take it. That's that's so nice. <laughs> yeah, of course, I mean, KDP is global. We wanted to include people. To show <laughs> like, hey, there are people who use this. Who you know? Yeah. What happened to the pet peti petition? Yeah. Um. So I let it. You know. I, you know, talked about it for a week. It got about over 200 signatures, which I'm so surprised about mm -hmm. because I didn't expect such a good response. I thought it would be like, oh, you know, some people think this is cool. But I'm so grateful for like people who shared it. And um, I sent out an email to Amazon yesterday. I got a response, which was, you know, good. Um, but it, it felt like an automated email. It was very robust. Mm -hmm kind of like oh thanks for sharing your thoughts we'll consider it and mm -hmm. it was very like dead it sounded very dead I guess yeah but at least we got to sp spread awareness about stuff and helped people become more proactive about their contracts and stuff like that yeah I, yeah when like literally when I started the self-publishing and you have to agree this like you're getting this 20 pages thing. I literally read everything. I, I can say I read everything, every line. <laughs> because I was, yeah, okay. I also made bad experiences of these publishers and where you read this contract and you're like, wow, I get so used. And I don't know how's the, um, how's the English word. <laughs> but I can't say that because then I'm cursing. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, uh, I read the whole 20 pages and I was really satisfied with that because I read many bad things. And mm -hmm. then I read your post and that was actually the first moment I realized that it's really unfair. Mm -hmm. I didn't thought of, I, maybe I didn't think of that before, but I don't know. I was really like, man, this is true. They're saying it's free, but then you have to pay the the prince, like literally when you go to a publisher, you also have to pay the prince. Like, yeah, but it's, they're not upfront about it. And, you know, I kind of, I knew about it, but I didn't know how to, what to do about it because I can't, there's no, Amazon yeah. is technically free. So it's the most convenient and widespread platform and service. So, mm -hmm. you know, you can't really do anything when you're trying to publish a book. Yeah. And they also have so many money that you're thinking like, Mm -hmm. they can they can afford the print costs and for that i have to say do you have a paperback or i do i do have a paperback so i don't know but if it's really it looks good it looks good but the the front cover is always you know it's not yeah. staying there there's a little bit on the spine always there's always some yes in the print it's so annoying and it's just like i would expect a little better quality from a company that's so big yeah, that's true. Actually, it took me so long to like actually upload the cover yes. because they always said it's not, not it's not re sized right mm -hmm. rightfully. But I was like, this is the right size. Like I took these these calculators from them, and they said it wasn't right. And now it has like these white borders, and I'm like, oh yeah. shit, this looks so awful. No, because like I spent so long on the cover. Like I had yes. I problem as you it's just it looks easy the interface is very user-friendly but when you get there and actually have to do stuff mm -hmm. it, it takes forever yeah because I don't know because I was so I was so happy when they took the cover and then I'm getting the prints and I'm like there are white borders like mm -hmm. they were wrong <laughs> <laughs> like hello after I resized it for 50 times, they're not saying that these has white borders. Like, I didn't took them. Yeah. Oh, so awful. But, but I'm grateful I'm not the only one who has this problem. I feel like a lot of people have the same problems. With yes. Because you're doing it yourself, you know. It's so difficult. It's actually such a great feat to be able to, you know, 
do things on your own. Yeah, exactly. But also the the um the the format of the book. Like literally it wasn't right because I have so much borders now on the left side and like oh this looks weird. It looks like a poetry book but it's a novel. <laughs> I miss create space honestly. They had like they had formatting templates. They had, you know, they had stuff ready for you to use and it was so much easier and then they had yeah. the whole thing. Yeah. And also had the problem with Kindle that Kindle didn't took the font I wanted to use. So I took the print on demand thing because that looks looked like the book, like the paperback. And I don't know, but do you have the same? Like you have Kindle. Did you had like the, did they took your font you wanted to use or did they take another font? Well, they used, I published with CreateSpace back mm -hmm. in 2018 so they had like a list of fonts that were, you know, that they could. Okay. So I did, I was lucky to get that settled there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's also not, I don't know, but in the, like in the Kindle thing, it's not the size, like it doesn't have the format, like the PDF format is not how a Kindle format looks like for me. Yes. It's I so don't know. confusing. Like the, making the Kindle book was actually just as hard as the paperback like I thought it'd be easier because it would it was just a file yeah but then resized everything yeah exactly oh my god I'm also saying like next year like literally I'm all I was thinking about like releasing many books but then I was like okay maybe one book for one year is enough <laughs> yeah I don't know I could you can write so fast like I'm a very slow writer so it takes me a long time to get something out no actually not it's it's like people telling me like i really better reading i will read what your book once in my life but <laughs> i just have so many books by friends that i have to read and they're like yeah. so big and i'm like i can't read this all i'm so such a such a slow reader but i'm really yeah. writing fast yeah so maybe you read faster than me. <laughs> no, I don't. I really, I read so slow. I have a huge TBR. Like I'm trying to juggle writing and reading books and reading people's oh. books because, you know, <sighs> the authors. But yeah, it takes a lot of time. Oh. <laughs> but I think, you know, sometimes it says good things take time. Yeah. Yeah. Um. <clears throat> When do you write the most? Like, is it night or is it day? Um, I used to wake up really early to write because, like, no one would be awake and I'd have that, you know, quiet space and everything. But now it's kind of like, because I haven't started school yet. I'm starting next week. So I write throughout the day, you know, when I feel like it, which is really nice to have. But usually when I'm in school, I write at night, you know. Okay. I have enough time to do stuff. Yeah. Really? I think I'm doing that too because when while writing Follow Me, I wrote literally in every break in school. So I wrote I handwritten I have handwritten it and I wrote in every break and every single minute I had free time. And I think that's my that's maybe why I've done it in six months. Mm -hmm. But you know, now I'm not handwriting anymore because I can do this with my wrist and that stuff. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm just, just writing on my laptop and I think it's really getting difficult to write with the laptop in school because we in, yeah. here in Germany, we don't use laptops in school. Mm -hmm. We're still like the books and the, mm. how are you saying, like the papers and oh. <laughs> No, yeah, I remember like bringing notebooks to school and just like, during lunch I would just sort of like do stuff <laughs> and people would be like are you okay and I'm like yeah <laughs> yeah that's true literally when I wrote that book in school I should I have to say I got bullied in that school where I was so I really had like that was my chance to like get away from them like saying hey I'm writing right now go away um mm -hmm. that they don't insult me and that stuff so that was kind of, I don't know, I think it's different. It's a different situation. I tried to write in school now this year where I changed school. So I was in a different school 
and the better friends and that stuff. But I think I wouldn't have the time to write in school. I really think I wouldn't have. So that idea, because I'm writing now, actually a book is a good um, advice of you to write at night. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I remember I wrote like half of a book when I was 12 also because I was bullied in school and I was kind of like, well, I'm going to be cool and do this and self-publish it, you know, but then I just did not have the motivation to finish writing it. Mm -hmm. So I went ahead, published half a book and then took it off like a year later because I was so embarrassed of it. Was it that short story or was it something different? It was um, called Escape. I probably can't find it now. So I about that one. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I wrote Follow Me when I was 13. So, yeah, but you then too, like, mm-hmm. wow. But actually, I have this book, like, with 10 years, I discovered that I want to become an author because mm-hmm. I started writing a book, but then I deleted it, and I'm still trying to rewrite it. Mm-hmm. But I think I'm giving up. I didn't really think I'm giving up. It's just, you know, when you're rewriting a book like thousands of times, it's not that what it was. And you may be thinking like, you keep, it feels like your ideas are getting less and less original because you're so used to them. You don't get that writer perspective. Yes, exactly. You're still writing the same scene Mm -hmm. and it gets boring and boring and boring. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Um, When did you discover to become an author? Um, well, I would say I've been writing for like the longest time. I started drawing first and then I was like, okay, maybe I can put some words to that. So I draw. Yeah. (laughs) I wrote like weird little stories through weird little comics about like mosquitoes and this character (laughs) named Swamp and his like pet pig or whatever. And then I realized, oh, I could, I'm like getting a lot, a lot more serious about writing maybe I can do a lot more with it so I started writing longer things and then Bus 59 and a Half was my first like official book that was you know full length Mm -hmm. um, an actual thing and I don't know I just I feel like it's my passion it's like the something I could do for the rest of my life I don't think I would be able to live without writing it's just Mm -hmm. present you know yes Yes, same here. I'm always thinking like, I want to become one day, you know, I want to make music and I want to make movies and I'm podcasting, I'm editing a lot of stuff. But I will still say like, I don't know, imagine the 30, um, I will get asked like, hey, introduce yourself. And I will still be like, hi, I'm Bonnie Alves and I'm an author. And everybody will be maybe like, but she's that and that and that. But I will still say like, I'm an author. (laughs) Yeah, like that's my first go to label I guess like people will be like oh so you have like a job I call Mm -hmm. it a job it's technically not a job I mean it is but you know you get what I mean yes like it's (laughs) self-employment um (laughs) but yeah like I'm very interested in acting and film writing and just like movie producing and I'd love to do all of that but I just feel like I don't have enough um, knowledge in those areas and Mm -hmm. like branching out from writing is just like how I plan to go on with things. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. Also when I'm thinking like one day maybe I will have a family and maybe then making music or podcasting won't be a thing anymore. I will still be writing. Like if my children around, I will still be like. (laughs) Yeah, because writing is, like, so universal. You can do it anywhere, anytime, and people might expect you to have, like, a normal job that yes, well, but arts is just what keeps the world moving. Yes. Because without entertainment, we would be so bored and so materialistic. Yes, that's true. Yeah, like, literally, I'm coming from vacation with my grandparents, mm-hmm. and... I yeah they were it wasn't that good but actually I really felt I felt this that they don't take I mean they were proud of myself that I'm fin that I published this book and that stuff but they were like 
really not taking seriously that mm -hmm. I'm riding 10 hours a day. And I was like, I really felt guilty at one point. And then I was like, no, I'm doing my passion. <laughs> yeah. It's like, I don't know. It's, it's just that some people don't see it as a valid career because mm -hmm. it's a lot riskier, a lot more riskier than, um, other careers. And it's just yes. like, it's not a hobby. It's, a job that I really want to do and people who love like doing what they do as a paid profession that those people are the luckiest people in the world yes that's true literally I have somebody uh he's 83 mm -hmm. <laughs> he's my piano teacher and he really brought me to the person I am right now because of the mindset and that stuff and he, I'm always saying like he's my discoverer <laughs> And um, he wrote two books, but he didn't publish them. He just prints them to give them away to friends or something. And um, he always said, when I, was, when I was writing, follow me, he was always saying, like, I'm worried about you because one day maybe you won't have anything to eat. And I was like, this scares me so much, but I still want to write. And I was like, you're weird. And when I published this book, um, I mean, he was saying like, okay, it's much money because I have to print them to my mm -hmm. own because I'm, um, I'm not really selling them over Amazon via Amazon. I'm like, um, getting these examples for offers and then mm -hmm. I'm sending them away on my own because of the, you know, because of the payment. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. And he was really like saying, oh, that costs many, much money. Um, yeah, but he was still proud of me. And I was like, that was the first step where I showed him, you can make money with that. So that was really yeah. like, oh, Maybe not, you know, there's still stuff. Yes. We're very focused on like having a plan B in case like writing this will work out. Like I've tried to think about that, but it's very difficult to imagine not writing. Mm -hmm. job. You know, like I don't know how much I could um do with that in terms of like my living situation in the future but yeah I I agree yeah also um I didn't write like since April so mm -hmm. I started writing again in August but I had like really months where I didn't do anything but then I'm thinking about like okay so I didn't write on my novel but I wrote lyrics and I wrote poets and I wrote, I channeled. So I'm kind of thinking like, I didn't stop writing. <laughs> yeah. Like we're always writing, always practicing, no matter what it is. Like, yes. I keep free writes that I use in actual books. Like, so if I feel bored or tired, or if I just really want to do something that's not related to my current project, I guess we need to learn to give ourselves permission to do that. Yes. Because it feels non-productive to not mm -hmm. work on your project but it still helps anyway yeah yeah that's true what is bus 59 and a half about it's um well it's a story about some characters who come together because of some very strange events and um i would say it's a slow burn psychological thriller you get that intensity and those emotions, but they build up very slowly. And they seem like separate pieces at first, but then they come together and, you know, yeah, I won't spoil it, but um, <laughs> it's very, um, I would say, tonal. There's a lot of like setting that applies to the theme. And, you know, it to me, it feels like almost a movie because mm -hmm. when I write, I imagine my plot as a movie so I can kind of see what's going on it's easier for me to describe but yeah it's about some characters it talks about mental health which I think is such an important issue that people overlook yeah lot, or don't you know talk about in the right way and there's a lot of negative stigma around it still so I wanted to write something that would provide like a first-hand experience of what it's like to go through some things yeah and, you know because I feel like if you want to write about a sensitive topic you would have to go through it first because it wouldn't be fair yeah if you're writing from an outside perspective you know about something that you don't really understand I guess if that makes sense so yeah that makes sense I wanted to like 
give mental health some more positive light, you know, instead of, because a lot of books and movies, they portray it in a really weird way. They over dramatize it or they say bad things. Yeah. 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 Exactly. That's the book I'm writing right now. Um, At the beginning, um, my main character is going, is depressive and thinking about suicide. That's like the first scene. And now I know that I was depressive writing that. And, Mm -hmm. but I didn't realize that moment. I was just writing. And now, and afterwards I found when I reread the pages, I was like, wow, I was really, because then I compared it to my life situation and was like, oh shit, I was really depressive writing that. And maybe I just wrote myself into this book. And actually I have so much respect for you that you're writing, that you wrote a thriller. Thanks. Like, I, I didn't know how I felt about the genre. <laughs> I always, I started out on fantasy and that didn't work out and I got really scared of it. But now I'm going back into fantasy, but dark fantasy this time. Mm-hmm. This is Ink Man, my current um, work in progress. It's also a mystery. I, I do like mysteries. But about that, that thing you said about realizing what you're going through, through your writing. Yeah, I think that stands true. Like you're subconsciously talking to yourself through your own words but through another character or something else and it's so self-reflective and each book is so special because there's always some sort of author surrogacy going on there yeah exactly exactly yeah because literally I wanted to write the book I'm writing right now should be a thriller or something or like an ancient ancient book um but it now it turns like and now I wrote 70 pages and it really turns out to be like a love novel again and I'm like no (laughs) how how I don't know how do you like why writing did you know this is a thriller or did you um well I don't know i for Bus of the Nine and a Half, I always knew that I wanted it to be suspenseful, and I kind of associated that with a mystery, and then I like thrillers. I like, I enjoy watching them, you know, but these days, I'm experimenting with genres, because I feel like it's brave to take a risk, even though you don't know what it is, and that might be mm-hmm. a good thing, because you don't fall into those tropes and cliches as easily as other people who yeah. are ex- with the genre do there's like ups and like pros and cons with both knowing and not knowing yeah so um yeah I was kind of reluctant to not write another psychological thriller but you know it's re- it's been really fun you know trying out new things with writing and seeing how things change when you put them in a different genre or a different time period or whatever yeah um so this this that this book I'm writing right now actually I would love to say the title but mm-hmm. this title always changes and mm-hmm. I have no idea how well I would call it at the end <laughs> so I'm just saying this book my current work in progress um so I wanted to have it a thriller and now it turns out to be a love story but do you know this feeling like if you're writing you don't know how it ends mm-hmm. all the time <sighs> Like some yes. people write from the back to the front and I can't always do that. I would like to have an idea of what happens, but <laughs> there's just so much freedom in writing chronologically, even though it's very hard. But you, you just live through that, what I call the point man character, which is, you know, that relatability point for the reader because they don't know what's going on. Yes. They're able to see through their eyes in some sort of way. Yeah. So actually, Follow Me starts at the end and mm-hmm. goes then to the beginning and then ends again at the end. <laughs> so I'm like one of you as well, like, how can you do that? But actually, it was really, really difficult to write that because I started with the, be- with the ending and then I was like, okay, now I want to tell the background story. Mm-hmm. And then you write and write and write. And at the end, by editing it, I was like, okay um well I'm glad I found the end again (laughs) yeah it was so difficult and I have to say literally if I would have like really edited it um 
I edited it so many times and people edited it, but I still, the book you can buy is the first draft. Really? Yes. That's so cool. I don't think I've ever felt happy about like a first draft. I'm not happy about that either. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I get that because like when you write a book and like you're writing it when you're younger or whatever, when you improve, it's like, I feel like I need to justify myself with a mm-hmm book or something it's not that I'm ashamed of my other books or whatever it's just that I've improved and I don't want people to see that old version when they could have a better one (laughs) yes exactly so I wrote the afterword one year ago so one year before I published it and my mom was saying she read it I mean she knew the story like literally I every time I had written a scene I told her it I Mm. read it to her I'm not doing that anymore but I did that at that time. <laughs> and so she reread it, what I'm really grateful for, because, you know, she could have said like, I, I know the story, I don't have to read it again. But she read it and said, there are all like these little mistakes. And then sometimes if the plot mistakes, like, you know, I was 14, 14, and it's my first draft what I published. But then at the end, when you read the afterword, because it starts like, I don't know what, but she said like, then everything makes sense. Then mm-hmm. all these mistakes getting fade away, like they just suddenly mm-hmm. away. And mm-hmm. I was like, wow. So I can be proud that I wrote this afterward, although I hate afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm really hoping that the people are reading the book and then also the, the afterward because mm-hmm. I'm one of these who like skipping the afterward. <laughs> <laughs> but let's just hope the reader is reading the afterward because then maybe it makes sense. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Like, I thought about including one of those or an author's note, but I felt like once the book is out, it's out. It's not, it's mine, but it's not mine anymore. It's for whoever reads it, whoever Mm -hmm. wants to think about it in whatever way they want. So it's theirs. So it's free to, um, up for interpretation. Yeah, that's true. But actually, I really felt like, I really felt that I have to write it afterward because I saw, I knew I'm publishing a first draft. Like, I wasn't, I wasn't so, so in the office community as I am right now. And I now know that it's usually, they have many readers who are like correcting everything and you have a final draft who you publish. Mm -hmm. I knew that kind of slightly at that time, but I, I knew it. So I said, I'm writing afterward because maybe then everything makes sense and when my mom said that I I have already forgotten that that I wrote the afterward because of that and then she said that I was like it worked (laughs) no like a lot of people have beta readers and editors but like I actually didn't do that because I'm so indecisive I knew if I had another opinion who like actually read the entire book before it was released I wouldn't be able to make up my mind. So I just tried to make every decision as quickly as I could just to keep on going. (laughs) But I I get what you mean. Like, yeah. Afterward to sort of let people know, this is what you mean. That's always, that always feels really, you know, it's kind of like a relief. You have like a justification or something, a note at the end. Yeah. But I'm really thinking about the book I'm writing right now. (laughs) The mystery book. Um, um I really think about like that people editing it and correcting the little I don't know the little grammar mistakes and tell me what makes sense and what doesn't make sense but I don't know why this is coming with this book so I'm always saying like the the plan for this book is that I'm writing the first draft Mm -hmm. then I'm making a second draft out of that on my own then I'm letting um my 83 year old best friend (laughs) correcting Mm -hmm. the grammar uh, mistakes then I'm editing them and then I let um I'm not quite sure if I should let two authors but um um I'm really thinking about asking Lucas Mm -hmm. but not about the grammar mistakes just because of the plot and because they're authors but Mm -hmm. I'm the the one I'm really asking is a good friend of mine Tatiana Stucki she's also from Switzerland Mm -hmm. she's from Switzerland but it's kind of you know we 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 speak the same language and um, I'm really thinking I'm asking her about that 
just to get an opinion an author's opinion you know right. what I mean yeah. like mm -hmm. not an opinion by an editor who's like yeah. never wrote anything <laughs> yeah no yeah like editors are much more I feel like they're much more logical they're kind yes. of yes which is good to have but like having an author's you know opinion on your writing they understand so much more about how the process that isn't seen works yes exactly exactly um, but I totally get the point that you say you do that on your own. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Maybe I'm doing that with another book. <laughs> Who no. knows? Uh -huh. <laughs> I would love oh. to have like, beta readers. Sorry. Um, for no, this Because I feel like, you know, it, yeah. it's much more like perspective. So yeah, it's something I'm willing to try out. Yeah, but it's funny that we we too release our first, published our first book just editing by ourselves on yeah. <laughs> and then our second book we're saying, Oh maybe we should get editors into it like authors. Yeah. yeah. That's funny that we have similarities into that. <laughs> yeah, because I feel like with your first book you don't always know what you're doing. Like I didn't know like you, I didn't know a lot about the author community. I didn't know how to yes. outline I didn't know how to do things. I just knew uh, words on paper <laughs> and um yeah. didn't know I could have these resources to use yes yes that's true I even didn't know that I published I was just thinking okay I published an unedited book maybe a lot of authors did that before me and first now I'm coming to the thoughts like oh I published my first draft I see nobody doing that that's really weird <laughs> Well, that's brave like being able to put out a first draft like oh. <laughs> and having people read it that's just yes so raw because the first drafts are just so full of like things you want to say that might get cut out <laughs> here, and then you have all these pretty little details you know this yes. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah 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 or what i'm saying if the if the book i'm writing right now i'm not reading that was it what I just wrote I want to write the first draft and then right. reading it because you know when I'm looking then at what I just wrote I'm thinking like oh I thought this would be longer oh <laughs> do you have yeah, this yes like you write and you feel like you're writing for such a long time and then a few days later you come back to it it's like oh it's like 200 words <laughs> exactly exactly your dialogues and you're thinking oh they're so long yeah. and then you're rereading that and you're like Wow, <laughs> they're, they're really short, like just three sentences. So that's like, <laughs> yeah. You said in one post, if it's too deep, this question, you don't have to answer it. But you said in one post that you started writing and that writing is your passion because you also can express your feelings and your words into paper, what you couldn't maybe do in front of your family or friends. Mm -hmm. You want to explain that a little bit more? Yeah. Um, so it's like, it's all, sometimes it's hard to articulate what you really mean without repeating yourself or dragging in things that you understand, but other people don't understand. And sometimes you have to start all the way from the beginning to get where you are. And that takes a long time. And it's frustrating to explain your entire history of problems that bring you to why you feel about a certain thing this day but with writing it's like you're able to do that through a character it, it's not like hiding I don't think it's more of like projecting through a different voice and maybe it helps you solve your own problems you know like writing from writing about your situation in a different voice might bring some light to your own thing that's going on but yeah and I feel like you can be a lot more creative with writing you can use like flowery words you know although being able to understand what you wrote is the most important thing yeah um, but yeah I feel like writing is just such a great way to express the things you can't always say in real life yeah so, yeah there's the flowering words I always get from my chat I'm never getting an a in German mm -hmm. Because I'm always using flowering words. <laughs> for example, if we have to write like an article from a newspaper and then I'm putting flowering words into it, then they're always like, let them out. <laughs> Do you have the same problem? 
Yeah, like, I'll be writing something for school, and I realize, ow, I have to, like, actually condense this. It's too flavorful. There's too much, like, stuff that isn't necessary, but to me, it's like, oh, you know, it makes it so much more alive. Yeah, yeah. Also, an English lesson, I'm always getting, like, my English teacher said to me, um, you really write well, but you should write more difficult. What says I should write more seriously? <laughs> not like this, like, mm -hmm. not more like these flowering words and that stuff, what I use in English lesson. Mm -hmm. But this mm -hmm. is so the same problem as in German. Oh. Yeah, because you're so used to writing in a certain voice for a character. Yeah. So it translates into your other writing that shouldn't have that. <laughs> How, how do I convert myself? You know, you have to kind of have that switch where you're able to write a professional email or your book or like, <laughs> you know, a text message, you know, yeah. like, there's so much variation in those. Yeah. I'm always the one who sends so long text messages because I'm staring, telling a story and somebody's maybe telling it in four sentences, but I'm like 40. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I also always with my friends, if they ask me something, what, then I'm always like, oh, this is a long story. And then I'm always like talking, 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 mm -hmm. talking. This never yeah. ends. <laughs> yeah, but I think we should be proud of that. Of course, our society and our schools tells us that this is not the right way to write, for example, an article for the New York Times. But, you know, that's not what we want to do in the future. <laughs> so we should be proud of that and keep that. And this was, ladies and gentlemen, my episode with Mel Ingrid. I interviewed her back in 2020, September. Wow, that feels like a half year ago. It is a half year ago. Oh my goodness, time flies by so quickly. Um. Anyways, I interviewed her back in September 2020. And so many things changed. And I think we both, Mel and I, we can agree that we were we were different people at that point and i hope you enjoyed listening to our i don't know younger selves i mean i hope you're not young but like a different version of ourselves and i hope you enjoyed this writer's talk about kitty b publishing all that stuff maybe it also helped you like you're not feeling alone anymore um so make sure to subscribe to this channel and if you want to know, because I didn't ask Mel in this episode, my I asked her, but I didn't put it into the final cut of this episode. I asked her also the five life questions. And if you want to check them out, you can do that with, um, with going to the link uh, in the description of this episode. And there you can find the link to the five life questions. So I wish you a wonderful evening, afternoon, when, wherever you are in the world. And I wish you a wonderful start into the next week. And oh my gosh, I can't believe I can tell you that now. But if you're interested in in reading Follow Me, because we we both talked about it. Mel and I, we talked about Follow Me, my first debut novel, which was at that time still in German. If you want to listen to it and you're interested in it now, tomorrow you can pre-order the English version of Follow Me. Oh my gosh, I'm so proud of myself that I'm finally putting out the translation of my German debut novel. And yeah, so you can, tomorrow you will know the details where you can pre-order my book um, if on my Instagram. So, oh my gosh, what for an exciting week in front of me. Um... Yeah, I hope you have at least a wonderful week as I will have as well. And I wish you a lovely Sunday evening, afternoon again. That's it. <laughs> Your host, Bonnie Overson. Mm -hmm.